بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله اشترى من المؤمنين أنفسهم وأموالهم بأن لهم الجنة يقاتلون في سبيل الله فيقتلون ويقتلون وعدا عليه حقا في التوراة والإنجيل والقرآن ومن أوفى بعهده من الله فاستبشروا ببيعكم الذي بايعتم به وذلك هو الفوز العظيم صدق الله العظيم وقد صدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين Respected elders, dearest brothers and sisters, beloved youth, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we have reached the final session of our series regarding Jannah. And everybody that has been taking part and everybody that has been listening, we have understood one very, very important aspect of life is that no matter how good this world can ever be, no matter how great, no matter how many people come together to try and make life nice for you, no matter how much money is invested for luxury and the good things of this world, nothing can ever compare to Jannah. And the little bit that we've covered, brothers and sisters, in this series, these are just the few examples that the Prophet ﷺ told us about. A huge portion and chunk of Jannah is that which no human being will know. None of us will truly understand the reality until we get there, inshaAllah. Because Rasulullah ﷺ, he said, فِيهِ مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرٍ The reality of Jannah is that it's that thing which no eye has ever seen the likes of it. وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ No ear has ever heard the likes of it. So what you've heard from me or anybody else about Jannah till now, that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just the little bit that's there. The remaining part of Jannah, our ears have never heard the likes of it. وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِ بَشَرٍ No heart has ever imagined the likes of what Jannah will actually be like in its reality. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant it to us all. We covered, my dear brothers and sisters, whether it's food of Jannah, whether it's the houses of Jannah, whether it's the entertainment and the happiness of Jannah, anything regarding Jannah, it's superior to this dunya. Everything about paradise, it outdoes anything this world can offer you. Subhanallah. One of the things um, that was mentioned, Ibn Abid Dunya rahimahullah, he narrates that the people of Jannah, when they will be enjoying their bounties, they will be eating, they will be drinking, they will be visiting each other. One of the things that they will enjoy the most is the things that they will hear. The bounties of the ears. And Allahu Akbar, what are the things that will delight their ears? Is to hear the sounds of tasbih. To hear subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. That is what will delight their hearts in paradise. That's the entertainment of paradise. That's what makes jannatis happy. Jannatis get happy by hearing the praise of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. That gives us a hint. Who are the Jannatis in this dunya? What pleases you? What makes you happy? The sound of the Qur'an, 
the sound of the words of the Prophet wasallam is that what pleases your heart and brings happiness to you? Or is it the other junk that's out there on the radios? What brings ease and happiness? Allahu Akbar. Like I said, we just touched the tip of the iceberg. The narrations make mention that on that day when the people are in paradise, Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala will actually tell all of the malaika, sing my praises, sing Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. Make my ibadah and my tasbih. The people of Jannah, whatever they're busy doing, eating, drinking, talking, enjoying, the moment they hear the tasbih of the malaika, they stop everything that they're doing. Wow, we want to hear how they're praising Allah. That's what brings joy to their hearts, brothers and sisters. In this dunya, are we like that? If you're like that in this dunya, inshallah, you'll be from those people that will be like this in the akhirah. That your heart yearns for the book of Allah. Your heart yearns and desires. When can I hear the words of the Prophet ﷺ? If weeks and weeks and months and months go by, we didn't hear the book of Allah. We didn't hear the words of the Rasul ﷺ. All we're doing is making money. All we're doing is deeper and deeper into the dunya. That's a sign of a spoiled heart. And that's a sign the heart is not like how the heart of the people of Jannah will be. The people of Jannah will enjoy Allah's praise. And subhanallah, it's made mention that from all of the angels, the one who Allah gave the greatest voice, the be most beautiful and sweetest voice, it was given to Israfil alayhi salam. And in Jannah, Allah will command Israfil alayhi salam to glorify, to recite, and to make tasbih. And all the people of Jannah, they will listen. And it's also made mention that in this dunya, who was the Prophet that used to glorify Allah in the most beautiful of voices to such an extent, the birds would glorify, the mountains would glorify, they would all praise Allah when this Prophet would start praising Dawood alayhi salam. So it's made mention, Allah will tell Dawood alayhi salam in Jannah, glorify Allah. The way you used to do it in the dunya with your beautiful voice, praise Allah for the people of Jannah. And then when he does that, all the people of Jannah, they will listen and they will hear how he is praising and glorifying Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, what is the pathway that a person gets to this Jannah? How does a person reach this Jannah? You reach this Jannah through a deal, which Allah mentions in the Quran. Every Muslim has already made this deal with Allah. Allah has given you something and you owe Allah something. What was that deal which was made? Inna Allah hashtara min al mu'minina anfusahum. Allah has made this deal. He has purchased from the believers. Allah has bought from you. He's taken from you two things. Every believer, every Muslim, you have agreed to this deal. You've given this to Allah. Anfusahum wa amwalahum. You've given Allah your lives. And you have given Allah your wealth. Oh Allah, it doesn't belong to me, it's for you. My life, it's yours. What I do, it's for you. What pleases me and what makes me happy, that's not what matters. What pleases you and what makes you happy. This is the goal and purpose of my life. Allah has purchased that from us, your lives, your wealth. يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ They fight in the path of Allah. They kill, they're killed. This is a promise which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made. The Torah, the Injil, the Quran, all these divine books, they have this covenant and this deal that the Muslims have made with Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. So the price for Jannah is what? Your life. The price for Jannah is your wealth. The price for Jannah is from head to toe, 
to be conscious of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. That is how a believer gets into Jannah. And I made mention yesterday, when Jibreel alayhi salam saw paradise, he said, nobody can hear about this place, except they're going to enter it. Jannah is so amazing. Anyone that hears about it, there's no way that they're not going to do what it takes to reach. And then when he saw Jahannam, he said, Ya Allah, this place is so scary, so much punishment and torture. Anybody that hears of this place, I'm sure they're going to run away from it and they'll never enter it. They'll be far away from this place. Then what happened next? Allah put the barriers and the surrounding of Jannah, the barriers and the surrounding of Jahannam. Jannah was surrounded with what? Hardships, tribulations, difficulties. When Jibreel alayhi salam saw that, he said, Ya Allah, now I fear. How will people ever enter this paradise? It's surrounded with barbed wire, difficulties, hardship. How will they reach? I don't think people will be able to go into Jannah. And then when he saw around Jahannam was all temptations, desires, having fun, being cool, being popular, the good things of this dunya, which are impermissible, the haram desires, Jahannam was surrounded with all of that. When Jibreel alayhi salam saw this, he said, Ya Allah, I fear people are going to jump straight into the hellfire because they're trying to fulfill their desires. They will want to fulfill their expectations. They will want to fulfill their lower inclinations and temptations. That's going to lead them to jump inside. This is the price to reach Jannah. The price of Allah, Allah's commodity, it's expensive. What is the commodity of Allah? It's paradise. Paradise will cost you. And Allahu Akbar, brothers and sisters, when the light of Iman is in the heart of a person, when the light of faith and the sweetness of faith, a Muslim tastes it. Wallahi, nothing in this dunya will be equal to sacrificing for the sake of Allah. That is where a person's joy will be. That is where a person's happiness will be, is in Allah's obedience, is in sacrificing for Him, is in doing everything for the sake to please Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Subhanallah, it's mentioned about the great companion Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala an. His father Abdullah, he became shaheed, he became a martyr, in the battle of Uhud and his family, or was it Badr, Badr or Uhud, one of the battles, and his family had a very, very difficult time accepting his loss, accepting that he's passed away. They were grieving, lots of sorrow, and it was very, very difficult for them. So they would come to the Prophet and they would ask, what happened to our father? Where is he? What is his status? What is he doing right now? They would ask these questions to console themselves. Is he in paradise? And subhanAllah, in some narrations, the Prophet ﷺ said, they asked, is he in a garden? The Prophet ﷺ said, garden? One garden? The, the rank and status that your father has reached through his sacrifice, he is in gardens, multiple, enjoying himself at this time. Allahu Akbar. And then the Prophet ﷺ made mention that Jabir ibn, the, the father of Jabir ibn Abdullah, when he passed away عنه, as a shaheed, he went to the next life and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to him. And when Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala spoke to the father of Jabir, عنه, he told Abdullah, the father of Jabir, he said, is there, anything that you, is there anything else that you desire? Is there anything else that you want? Do you know what he said? He said, Ya Allah, I'm a sinner. I have shortcomings. In order for me to fulfill the expectation and the, the dictates of being your servant, Oh Allah, please send me back to the dunya so that my blood could be shed for you a second time to be a true servant towards you and to reach true forgiveness. I need to go back to the dunya and give my life for you again. Allahu Akbar. And, the Prophet, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained to him, the decree has been set. Nobody is going to go back to the dunya. You're here and now you're here for good. And look at what he said. 
He said, Oh Allah, can you at least give the message to the people that we've left behind? Give them this message that we are happy, we are comfortable, we are taken care of, our sustenance reaches us, we're in a good condition. Don't cry and be sad over us. Allah is taking care of us. Allahu Akbar. And then the ayah was revealed. وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا Don't ever think that the people who died in the cause of Allah, that they're dead. بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ They are alive and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them their sustenance. Subhanallah. So this dunya, as we see, the only happiness, the only true happiness that a person can get here is giving your life for the sake of Allah, is the moments of worship, is the moments of sacrifice, is the moments of fighting your urges to sin, is the moments of waking up for Salatul Fajr when you're sleepy, for waking up for tahajjud and making dua when everybody else is asleep. Those are the true moments of happiness which even the people of Jannah enjoy. Because the greatest bliss is paradise. What people of paradise enjoy, that's the greatest honor and the greatest bliss that exists. If there was anything that was more enjoyable than that, the people of Jannah would have had it. Because Jannah is the pinnacle of bliss and happiness. And what do people of Jannah enjoy? Right? We covered in our series, Alhamdulillah, that every week on a Friday, the people of Jannah, they visit and they see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when they see Allah, Allah lifts the veil. And they see Allah and they speak to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. They forget all of the bounties of paradise. They forget the food. They forget the silk clothing. They forget the gold and silver palaces. They forget the singing and the beautiful music that the trees, the rustling of the leaves of the trees of Jannah brings. They forget all of that. The only thing that they want to do, Oh Allah, I just want to look at you. Oh Allah, I just want to be with you. Oh Allah, that's all that I want. I don't need, I don't need the palace. I don't need hood. I don't need any of it. Ya Allah, if I can just look at you and be in your presence and glorify you, that is the coolness and contentment of my heart. The amazing thing, brothers and sisters, is that same glorification, that same tasbih, that same dua, that same closeness with Allah, you don't have to wait for Jannah. You can have that closeness here in this dunya. And that's why many ulama would say, وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ For the one that fears Allah, for the one that fears the standing in front of Allah, that person will have two jannats, two jannas, two gardens for that person. So many of the ulama would say, it means when he has devoted himself or herself for the sake of Allah, this dunya itself will be a jannah for that person. This world itself will become a paradise for that person. We were learning in the ta'aleem, subhanallah, so many of the companions, you know, Abbad bin Bishr, Ammar ibn Yasir, radiyallahu anhum ajma'een, they were appointed um, to safeguard and be the security for the Muslim people who were in camp. They had to guard the borders of the Muslim uh, camp to ensure no enemies will come and attack. So both of these great companions, radiallahu anhum, they said, let's take turns. You go to sleep and I will perform salah. And then when I'm done, I'll go to sleep and then you can perform salah. So Hazrat Abbad ibn Bishr radiallahu an, he stood up and he started performing salah. And Ammar bin Yasir went to sleep. While he's standing up in his salah, one of the mushrikeen, he said, look up over there on the mountain. Look, it's a Muslim. And he's doing his prayer. Perfect opportunity. He said, come, let's go. They went closer. He got his bow and arrow. And he shoots Abad ibn Bishr. Radiyallahu an. He strikes him once. Abad ibn Bishr is standing and he didn't move. He said, maybe we missed. Shoot a second time. They shot him a second time. He's still standing still, no motion. They said, man, look at your aim. He's still standing there. Shoot him a third time. Maybe you'll get him this time. 
The third time they struck him, he broke his salah. And he went to Ahmad ibn Yasir and he woke him up. Ahmad ibn Yasir said, what happened to you? You're bleeding. You've been hit. And subhanallah, the three arrows, they struck him. But he continued in his salah. And Ahmad ibn Yasir radiallahu anhu, he said, what are you doing? Why didn't you break your salah earlier? He said, oh Ammar, during the salah, I was reading Surah Al-Kahf. And he said, I was enjoying Surah Al-Kahf so much that when the first arrow came, right, it's like I didn't even feel it. I wanted to keep reading Surah Al-Kahf. The second arrow came, I said, it's all good, it's okay, it's not a big deal. Let me keep reading Surah Al-Kahf. He's enjoying his recitation. He said, when the third arrow struck me, he said, the thought came to me, I'm bleeding. What if I bleed to death? Ammar bin Yasid is sleeping. I die over here. The disbelievers, they will come into the camp. There's nobody protecting the rest of the Muslims. They will go and attack the Prophet ﷺ. He said, when I thought of the danger to the life of Rasulullah ﷺ, that's the only reason why I broke my salah. Otherwise, I would have continued reading Surah Al-Kahf, even if it meant that I would die. It's okay, I would die, but I, was, I would enjoy it. The last thing in my life is finishing reading Surah Al-Kahf. You see, they learn to enjoy life as a Muslim. They learn to find enjoyment in, in ibadah. They learn to find enjoyment in devoting themselves to Allah wa Taala. This is what it means. This is what Islam is about. Sweetness of Iman, you have to taste it, you have to feel it, you have to be devoted. This, this is what makes a Muslim. Deen is not a burden. مَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He did not make in this deen any burden. Deen, if a person feels like it's a burden, that means we have not tasted the sweetness of Iman yet. And Allahu Akbar, Allah mentions in the Qur'an, وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ The salah, what is it? It's a burden except on who? Except on those who have khushu', those who have humility to Allah. Their hearts have been connected with Allah wa ta'ala. The last companion that I want to talk about, inshaAllah, before we conclude our series, was a great companion by the name of Thabit ibn Qais. Al-Shammas radiyallahu ta'ala an. So very briefly, Thabit ibn Qais, he was a leader of the Ansar. So the Ansar of Medina, they had many different leaders, many different people who had different tasks and roles. One of them was Thabit ibn Qais, who was a khatib of the Ansar. So he used to give, you know, khutbas, he used to give lectures, he used to speak, and, you know, sermons and being out in the public, Thabit ibn Qais, nice, eloquent, loud voice, he would speak. And after some time, what had happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses of Surah Al-Hujurat, where he says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. O you who believe, do not raise your voices over the voice of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Your voice should always be below the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَا تَجْهَرُوا لَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ Do not be loud in your speech with him. كَجَهْرِ بَعْضِكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ Like how you're loud with one another. When you're talking to the Prophet alayhi salam, your voice should go down. You should show that humility and respect in front of nubuwa, in front of prophethood. You can't speak like how you speak to your friends or random people. You don't speak in that same tone in front of the Prophet wasallam. So what had happened was, Thabit ibn Qais, since he was the khatib of the Ansar, to be a khatib you have to talk loud, right? Your voice has to go extremely loud. When these verses were revealed, he said, Ya Allah, my voice would always be very, very loud because I had to deliver the message to the Ansar. I have disrespected the Prophet ﷺ. The verse says, no believer's voice should be louder than the voice of the Prophet ﷺ. And my voice was always going over the voice of the Prophet ﷺ. Many, many days passed. Thabit went missing. They didn't see him in the masjid. And it got to the point 
Even the Prophet ﷺ asked about him. What happened to Thabit? Thabit ibn Qais, where is he? We haven't seen him in a long time. Is he okay? So the Prophet ﷺ sent someone to go check on him. And when the person went to go check on him, look at what Thabit radiallahu anhu, what he said. He said, this verse has been revealed about lowering your voice in front of the Prophet, not raising your voice. And you all know how loud my voice is over the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I'm convinced, anna min ahlin nar. He said, I'm convinced I'm from the people of the hellfire. I'm, I, I'm destroyed. I'm from the people of the hellfire. There's nothing that I can do now. He's just sitting hopeless inside of his house. He doesn't want to come to the masjid. He doesn't want to come to the Prophet alayhi salam. He says, I'm that guy that his voice would be louder than the Prophet alayhi salam. I'm doomed. I'm destroyed. Jahannam is my place. Every person that would visit him, they would go inside. They would see him sitting down and his head would be downward. And he would just be to himself, very grieved, very gloomy, always crying and thinking, I've been destroyed because I'm from the people of the hellfire. فَذَكَرَ ذَٰلِكَ سَعْدٌ لِلنَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ The neighbor that checked on him, Sa'ad رضي الله he came to the Prophet السلام, and he told him what had happened. He said, Thabit is at home. He says, I'm from the people of the hellfire and his head is always down and he's crying all the time. And he says, my voice went over the voice of the Prophet, so I'm destroyed. When the Prophet ﷺ heard this, listen to what he said. Basically, Thabit says he's from the people of the hellfire. بَلْ هُوَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ Thabit, rather, rather than being from the people of the hellfire, instead, Thabit is from the people of paradise. Give him this message. Allahu Akbar. And the people would say that after this would take place, Anas bin Malik radiallahu an, he says, all of us, other companions, when we would be around Thabit ibn Qais, people would kind of be like whispering to one another, psst, psst, that's the guy, Jannah. That's the person of Jannah. That's Thabit ibn Qais. The Prophet ﷺ gave him the certification he said he's from the people of paradise. So respected listeners, one thing that we see from Thabit ibn Qais, the seriousness that he took in deen. The seriousness that he took in one verse of the quran -i kareem It was enough to bring a revolution in his life. He thought he's destroyed. Brothers and sisters, we read so many ayat. Don't gossip. We read so many ayat. Perform your salah. Give your zakah. Don't raise your voice. Do not have jealousy. Do not be walk you know, with arrogance in the earth. We read all of these ayat, but we say, it's okay, Allah's forgiving. It's all right, one day, inshallah. It's okay this, it's okay that. One ayah that Thabit ibn Qais read, that his life at that point, he felt like he was not living by it. He was not abiding by it. Look at how much it perturbed him. Look at how much it changed him. Look at how it put him in his house with his head down, making him sob and grieve and have this sorrow in his heart. Allahu Akbar, the Prophet ﷺ said, the one who misses one salah, فَكَأَنَّمَا وُتِرَ أَهْلُهُ وَمَالُهُ It's like you've lost all your property and you've lost all of your family. Brothers and sisters, what does it feel like to lose a loved one? Some of us may know. What does it feel like to lose a family member? Some of us may know that pain and that hurt. Rasulullah is saying, if you miss one salah, it's like you lost all your family all at once. And it's like you lost all of your property. If you've ever, you know, your car has been broken into, or you've been robbed of something, that bad feeling that you feel, Man, my property, something I worked hard for, it got stolen from me. It feels bad. It pains you. It perturbs you. That something that I worked hard for, I purchased with my hard-earned money, somebody else is now enjoying it unjustly for free. It hurts. Now, if it's your wallet, if it's a car, if it's one thing, you still have so much more things to benefit from, right? Now imagine 
all of your property, all of your family, all at once that's destroyed. How grieved would a person feel? The Prophet ﷺ says, one salah that's missed, it's to this degree serious. That's how iman manifests itself. That grief, that remorse, when you actually feel this, it gives you the himma, it gives you the courage, it gives you the ability. I'm not going to miss my prayers no more. I'm not going to engage in this sin anymore. I have to do better, I have to reach Jannah. I can't be trapped in this anymore. What gives you that courage and ability? This is exactly what it is. What the Prophet ﷺ is telling us here. Having that concern for yourself, having that concern for your deen. So this is how uh, Thabit radiallahu an, he was a person of Jannah. And just a little bit, a few things about him, some of the incidents that took place in his life, uh, which gave him this beautiful quality of being a man of paradise. One time, there was a person that came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, I'm in very difficult times. Is there anything you can help me with? The Prophet ﷺ, he went to the, the house, he checked around, there was nothing there. The Prophet ﷺ came out to the people. He said, is there anyone that can host this guest? Is there anyone that can take this guest in? He needs help, he needs a meal, he needs some food. Right? The Prophet, imagine the Prophet ﷺ himself didn't even have. Allahu Akbar. And he requested the rest of the people, can someone take care of this companion? Give him some food. One person came, he said, I will be the person to do it. And who was this man? It was Thabit ibn Qais. Radiallahu ta'ala an. So he brings this person home and he tells his wife, he says, do we have anything? I've brought a guest, a guest of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what did she say? She said, there's no food here. The only thing which was left, the little bit that was saved for the children, that's all that we have, right? Living on very meager, very tight conditions. Allahu Akbar. You know what Thabit radiallahu anhu, what he said? He said, put the children to sleep. Put the children to sleep, inshallah, Allah will prepare them for something for them tomorrow. Let them sleep hungry, it's okay. We have the guest of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They put the kids to sleep, and finally when the meal was brought, she said, even this amount, it's not enough for you and the guests to eat together. How's the guest going to eat alone? He's going to say, this little bit of food, I can't eat this, you know, and the host is just staring at you, right? It's not comfortable. You're supposed to eat together. So he said, don't worry. What you will do is, while we're eating, I want you to suddenly put the lamp out. Put the light out so that it becomes dark. And then I'll pretend like I'm eating. I'll make the noise like I'm eating. I'll put my hand in the food like I'm eating, but I actually won't eat. I will save the food for our guest. Allahu Akbar. They did this and Thabit ibn Qais, sleeps hungry, his family sleeps hungry, but their guest is taken care of. These were people that preferred others over themselves. And Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala revealed the verse in the Quran, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ They prefer others over themselves. وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا Even though they themselves are in poverty. They themselves are in poverty, but they give preference to other people. And finally, Thabit ibn Qais radiallahu ta'ala an in the era of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an he fought in the battle against those who had left Islam. Historically there was a, a group of people in the era of Abu Bakr Siddiq after the Prophet alayhi salam left this world they had left Islam. So Abu Bakr Siddiq he waged war against them and Thabit ibn Qais radiallahu ta'ala an he was part of that battle. When he went into this battle, the first thing that he did, it's made mention, that he put on itr, he purified himself, he put on fragrance, and he wore two beautiful white garments. Now in the middle of a battle, most people are not going to go in there dressed like it's Jumu'ah. Most people are not going to go into the battle dressed like it's Eid. But he came prepared as if it's a grand meeting that's about to happen. And subhanAllah, the reason why he did this was because during his lifetime, the Prophet ﷺ told him, Ya Thabit, 
Ama tarda an ta'isha hamida. Are you not happy that you will live in this world very, very praiseworthy? You will live a, a dignified life. And the way that you will leave this world, وَتُقْتَلْ شَهِيدًا وَتَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةِ You will leave this world as a martyr, and because of that you will enter Jannah. So Thabit ibn Qais, during this war, he's probably thinking to himself, I'm getting older now. Seems like my time is coming. This battle might be the one where I'll finally meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he wore his fresh clothes. He wore two white garments. And subhanallah, he fought very, very bravely in the middle of the battle. And eventually, he became shaheed in the middle of the battle. And from amongst his miracles, after he had passed away, one of his uh, armors... We know in that time, armor was expensive, armor was considered valuable. One person from the community saw Thabit ibn Qais is martyred. He's laying on the ground. He picked up his shield and his armor and he took it with himself. And he put it in his own place and he basically stole it. So that night, one of the Sahaba, radiyallahu an, he sees in his dream that Thabit ibn Qais comes to him. And when he comes to him in the dream, Thabit ibn Qais says, don't think this is a dream that you're gonna, you know, not take this seriously. Don't think that you're just seeing bogus. Give my message to the Amir Khalid ibn Walid and tell him that such and such person who looks like this and like this, he has this description, he has stolen the armor of Thabit ibn Qais and he has taken it into his tent and underneath the pillow and under the pot, which he put this thing on top of it, the armor is lying there. Make sure you retrieve that armor and you deliver it to Khalid ibn Walid. And the next thing that you will do, you will sell this and this of my property because I owe so and so this amount and I owe that person that amount. Through my properties that I've left behind, this debt must be cleared. When this particular companion he said, was it really just a you know, bogus dream or was there some reality to this? Finally, when they inspected and they investigated, they went into that person's tent underneath the pot, under the pillow, exactly as he had described it, the armor was sitting there. And exactly as he had said, I owe this person and I owe that person, fulfill my debts. Those debts were also confirmed and they were also passed off. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, he allowed, because usually when a person passes away, you're not allowed to touch their wealth and make decisions with it. But this was the only time in history where Abu Bakr Siddiq, he said, even though this man has already passed away, we believe this dream to be true. We're going to distribute his wealth and fulfill the debts the same exact way that he said. Allahu Akbar. Look, in their lives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored them their desires and their wishes and their needs, even after their death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even fulfilling those, those needs after they've left this world. It's mentioned about another great companion, Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala an. When he was martyred, the disbelievers, they said, we're going to take his body, this is going to be our prize trophy. We're going to cut his ears, we're going to make necklaces out of it, we're going to parade his body, we're going to mutilate him. We're going to disrespect his body. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala basically decreed, there's no way that that's going to happen. This companion will be protected. I will not allow his body to be desecrated. So what happened? Allah sent a swarm of wasps. Anytime the disbelievers would come near his body, the wasps would surround him and basically repel them and make them go back. As soon as they would go back, the wasps would go away. As soon as they would come near, they would return, protecting him. You can't touch this companion, Allahu Akbar. In this world, Allah honored them. And even after they died, after they left this world as martyrs, Allah still protected their bodies. This is what it means to be a person of Jannah. You're protected here, you're protected in the grave, and you are at extreme bliss and happiness in the next life. May Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala make us from amongst these people. Alhamdulillah, that brings us to the conclusion of our series. Alhamdulillah, I learned a lot myself. I benefited a lot from this series. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it. May Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala.
forgive me for any mistakes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it. Uh, all of the brothers and sisters who have been attending, diligently listening with full devotion and commitment, Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala reward you all. Maybe one day, you know, you'll be in Jannah. I could be suffering. Give me a hand of support at that time, you know. May Allah allow us to see the day, whatever we heard in the series, we will remember it and enjoy it, inshallah, in paradise. When we see our palaces, we'll say, this is what we learned. This is what we talked about. This is what we heard in the lecture series. When we see the Prophet salam, when we see our palaces, when we see Allah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to remember all of these good times that we had in this dunya, learning this series. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم إنا نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنا نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنا نسألك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار اللهم إنا نسألك الجنة وما قرب إليها من قول أو عمل ونعوذ بك من النار وما قرب إليها من قول أو عمل يا الله we ask you to grant us Jannah and whatever will allow us to reach Jannah, Ya Allah, whatever action, whatever desire, whatever thought, whatever mentality, whatever intentions, whatever spirit, Ya Allah, whatever strength is required, Ya Allah, to reach Jannah, Ya Allah, you grant it to us, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Ya Allah, protect us from Jahannam. Ya Allah, protect us from its flames. Ya Allah, protect us from its heat. Ya Allah, protect us from even hearing, Ya Allah, the punishment inside of that place, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Ya Allah, save us from all of the ways that will lead there, Ya Allah. All of the words that will lead there, Ya Allah. All of the attributes that will lead there, Ya Allah. All of the intentions and mindsets and mentalities, Ya Allah, that would lead a person to that fire, Ya Allah. We ask you to protect us and our families, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Ya Allah, allow us to experience the bliss of Jannatul Firdaus. Ya Allah, allow us all to experience the bliss Together, Ya Allah, in Jannatul Firdaus, with our families, Ya Allah, with our children, Ya Allah, with our progenies, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Ya Allah, protect us, Ya Allah, from losing our faith, Ya Allah. Protect us, Ya Allah, from fitan, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Protect us from the tribulations of faith, Ya Allah. Keep us steadfast in our deen. Keep our children steadfast in the deen, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Please accept from us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, please make this a source of our salvation, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, if anyone reaches Jannah through this, Ya Allah, don't deprive us, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Ya Arhamar Rahimeen, we ask you in this blessed month of Ramadan, Ya Allah, do not deprive us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, grant us only khayr, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, grant us khayr, Ya Allah, and protect us, Ya Allah, from being deprived, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Ya Allah, whatever mistakes were made, Ya Allah, we seek your forgiveness, Ya Allah. Please overlook our shortcomings, Ya Allah. In the speaking, Ya Allah, if there was anything wrong, we ask your forgiveness, Ya Allah. In the listening, Ya Allah, if there was any deficiency, Ya Allah, you forgive us, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Ya Allah, whatever khair came from here, Ya Allah, it is solely through your tawfiq and your enablement, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Falaka alhamdu wa laka shukr. All praise and all gratitude belongs to you. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta al-sami'u al-alim wa tub alayna innaka anta al-tawabu al-rahim wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in birahmatika ya Arhamar Rahimeen.